So let's start. First of all, a warm welcome, welcome to all of you and thank you very much for joining this uh, information session on the recent uh, Roadmap to Net Zero study uh, performed by Elia Group. So with this study, actually, we want to investigate a bit how a decarbonized energy system can look like in 2050. And one of the goals is also to see how such a system can work. And with this study, we want to take away some of the uncertainties uh, that still exist around decarbonized systems with high levels of renewables. So this session is focused more on Belgium. So it's you will see in the graphs uh, they they are focused on Belgium. This morning we had also an information session on Germany that will also be made available on our website. Before we start, I would like to let you know that the meeting will be recorded, and if technology uh, works, we will also make the recording available uh, on our website later on. So then let's see what we have on the agenda today. So first of all, I will give a general introduction um, on the study. And then in COVID times to keep things interactive, what we propose is actually four content blocks. Uh, we will start with future energy supply and demand. Then we go into flexibility, adequacy, and then we have a conclusion with some focus points. And for every of these blocks, we will have a separate uh, Q&A moment that we will organize via Slido. Uh, on that, I will explain more uh, later on. So it's a full agenda. Um, we hope on a lot of interaction. Uh, it's always nicer to do these kind of meetings in person, but because of COVID, uh, we hope that we found now a solution where we can interact a lot with the audience. So on the next slide, I will quickly go through the presenters today. So I'm Jan Voet, I'm manager of the System of the Future uh, department at Elia. We also have Raphael um, in this call. So Raphael is manager of the Scenarios Market and Adequacy uh, department at Elia Transmission Belgium. We have Louis, who is market and adequacy analyst, and then Kirsten, who also works in System of the Future as a market analyst. So those are the experts that today will guide you through the study and will answer your questions. And we also have Hannes de Grave in the call, which is another expert that supported us uh, in, in this study. So then the next question is on how to interact. Um, so we have set up a Slido uh, for this meeting. So if you go to slido.com, and you enter the code below, or you just follow the QR code um, that's shown on this slide, you will be able to introduce all your questions um, on Slido, and we will show them later on during the Q&A moment. Uh, so some rules for that. It's nice that you put your name uh, before each question. Um, that allows us also to get back to you if you don't have time to answer the question. Um, we will also go through the questions block per block, so please only introduce questions that are relevant for the block that's being presented. And also don't forget to like the questions that you want to see answered, because we will start with the most popular questions, and then we will see how much we can answer, and those that are not answered, we will come back to that um, after the meeting. So I will give you a little bit more time uh, with the codes and the website so that you can set this up. And then I think we are ready to start the, the presentation on the study. So let's give it another 10 seconds here. Voila. I will circulate the code also via the chat later on. So for those who didn't got it. Uh, so maybe to give a little bit of background, so Every year, uh, Elia Group does a study on a topic that is relevant uh, to society. So studies we've done in the past were on consumer-centric market design, on preparing the uh, electricity system for 2030, 
impact of e-mobility um, on the electricity grid and how smart uh, charging uh, could help us. And then this year we have looked at realization of the Green Deal, like how can we get to a climate neutral energy system? And that's a study we will present to you today. To give a little bit of background, so making the Green Deal a reality, how did we look to 2050? For this, if you look on the right hand side of this slide, uh, we have elaborated two distinct uh, transformation pathways to carbon neutrality. Uh, these are not exhaustive and we are fully aware that changes in policy can happen and technological breakthroughs can also happen. Yet we are convinced that with these two transformation pathways, the electricity focus and molecule focus one, we can deliver relevant insights already. And we believe that this is a good starting point for the debate on a 2050 decarbonized system. So how did we get to these two transformation pathways on the demand side uh, towards 2050? We started with a 1.5 tech scenario from the European Commission. So that's a scenario of the Commission where they uh, imagine a carbon neutral energy system uh, towards 2050. And based on that, we derived a first transformation pathway where we focus on a high degree of electrification of end use. So this is the electricity focused one. In this one, the demand for electricity goes up with up to 70% and even a little bit more uh, towards 2050 compared to today. And then the other scenario, there is still an increase of electricity demand towards 2050 in the molecule focus one, but obviously in that scenario, molecules take more important role in the end use uh, of energy. And so starting from these global scenarios on a carbon neutral energy system for 2050, we then zoomed in on the electricity system. And for the electricity system, on the left-hand side, we looked at three different dimensions. So the first one is energy balance, uh, future supply and demand of electricity. There we try to answer questions like, does Europe have enough renewables to cover its uh, total energy demand? And how are the renewables distributed across Europe? Where are the excesses of renewable energies? Where are the deficits? Then the second question we looked at is flexibility. If we look at 2050 in our scenarios, we have, for example, more than 1000 gigawatt of solar production in the electricity grid. So how can we manage uh, these kind of fluctuations? Uh, what amounts of flexibility do we need? And can we actually manage uh, such a system? And then the third block we looked at is adequacy. Um, and then we look at, okay, if there's one or two weeks, for example, little wind, little sun, how do we keep the lights on in a system with a high level of renewables? And so for our study, we simulated uh, entire Europe. So the 27 countries plus UK, Norway and Switzerland. But we then zoomed in on the implications for Belgium and for Germany. Well, uh, that's the introduction. And now I give the words to Raphael that will guide you through the first block on supply and demand. Yeah, thank you, Anne. So before going to the to the first block, uh, a bit more details on the on the methodology uh, that we use. So as Jan explained very well, um, on the first uh, first part, so the transformation path, uh, as he said, we looked at a scenario which is more electricity focused, more molecule focused. We quantify that for the whole continent, so not only Belgium and Germany, uh, as already explained. Um, and it's also a multi-energy scenario, so it's not only quantified for electricity. That's very important. So we have looked at all energy carriers, including feedstock, uh, but without aviation and international shipping. And that's the demand. Yeah. So that's your final consumption. On the other side, we also made assumptions on the supply. And if you looked again at whole Europe, and if you looked at different paces of increasing renewable capacities in Europe, so 1.5 times 3 times 4, I will come back to that. And this was done, I would say, for whole Europe. Um, and uh, with our granularity, uh, we went to the only granularity for the electricity, but that is the second block. Uh, first, with this kind of quantification, you can already uh, assess, for instance, the energy balance of every country on a yearly basis. So you can assess, okay, whether a country has enough uh, rest capacities to to uh, comply uh, to to meet the, the the demand requirements for a multi energy uh, uh, carrier, so not only electricity. And then, as indeed we are an electric 
TSO or electric TSOs, we have looked more uh, into details for the electricity system. And so this is the second block. We have used what we call a market simulation uh, of the electricity. So this is an economic dispatch tool. In the end, what's, what does the tool? It looks for every hour of the year and it will look whether uh, for every hour of, of the year, uh, each country can meet his supply and demand, electricity supply and demand. And for that, we have made indeed many assumptions, uh, but we also made a lot of sensitivities to test the impact of, for instance, the grid infrastructure. So we have uh, made variations on the grid. So for instance, we have used as a, what is written here, grid iOS N plus. So we have used unexpected grid for 2040, what is defined also by NSOE in some studies. We have also checked, okay, what is the impact of the copper plate? Okay, what if Europe would be a copper plate? Would that impact or not? Uh, the result we have found. We did the same on the flexibility. Uh, so the means of flexibility for the electricity consumption. Uh, we have also looked at low flexibility or high flexibility scenarios. So for instance, what if we take a scenario where we really will push uh, storage uh, uh, flexibility of, of heating devices, of uh, of transportation devices, etc. And so the market simulation can indeed give you ins a lot of insights, for instance, on uh, the need of of, of, uh, of backup capacities. Yeah, This is also something that will be presented later, the need for interconnecting or interconnections on a high level, and also the impact that we can see on flexibility means. So this is a, another, uh, let's say, the second block of type of analysis. The third one is what is called the Fourier analysis. This is also based on our early resolution, and it looks mainly at the residual demand, uh, and then again, different sensitivities. So first of all, again, on the grid, you can look at an isolated way, so the country as its own, or on a copper plate, looking at whole Europe. And also the time scale, so we have looked at different variations of this flexibility uh, needs for the short, the medium, and the long term. So you can also look at, for instance, uh, the impact of a certain risk portfolio. Yeah, or What if you have more PV or more wind, or what is the impact? What is the different correlations you see between rest uh, within Europe? Okay, so this is a bit the three types of, of, of analysis uh, that we have looked at. Um, and uh, I will then go to the first insight, uh, which is the next slide. Uh, thank you. And so the first insight, as already explained, is about the energy balance uh, uh, in Europe. Um, so as you might know or, or, or not, but Europe will be short on renewables. So we uh, we will to, we need to maximize that. But we also looked at uh, the different two pathways, so molecule and, 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 uh, and, and electricity. And you will see that actually uh, electrifying uh, is very efficient in terms of uh, uh, total amount of final energy that you might uh, require. So if you go to the next slide, but this should be clearer, I think, in the next slide. So if you look, what what do you consume today? So if you look at what is today consumed as energy, uh, including fixed source in Europe, I, you might know that more than 75% is fossil fuels. This is what you see on the first pie chart on the left. 42% uh, is liquid and solid fossil fuels, so oil and coal mainly. 22% is uh, no, sorry, uh, yeah, 22 is natural gas. We have some bio, biogas, bioenergy, the right feed, and then you have electricity. And of course, electricity needs also to be produced. Uh, and today, it's not all green, of course, um, even if the share is increasing. What we see is three main trends towards the futures. Um, the first one is that uh, you will we will require, of course, energy efficiency in, in your final demand. So insulation, for instance, uh, will drive the demand down. So by insulating, you reduce your, your need for heating demand. By being more efficient in your processes, industrial processes, uh, you will decrease the demand. So this is the first effect that was taken into account based on the 1.5 tech scenario from the European Commission. So that leads to a decrease of the demand. The second one is electrification. So by electrifying uh, your final demand, you will use more efficient end-use devices. So for instance, an, I, an IC engine car, so typical diesel or oil car you use today, uh, if you electrify that transportation, you will use three times or even four times less energy uh, to for the same amount of kilometers driven. The same for the heating as with heat pumps, uh, which where you can have gains of three or even times four. Uh, so this is the second reason why you see that the three other pie charts are, are smaller than in 2018. And the third one is indeed not everything can be electrified. And so you see that uh, the dark gray parts will disappear, uh, or at least we assume that it disappears. So all scenarios are really uh, uh, free of any uh, uh, carbon um, um, carbon fuels, and you will need, of course, a part that will be provided by green molecules, whether it's hydrogen or other fuels or derived fuels from hydrogen. Um, and we made the variation of the two scenarios, so ELEC and MOL, from the 1.5 tech, as you can see. On one side, we went really 
I would say, deep in the electrification to reach 70%, but you see also that the, the pie chart is smaller because by electrifying, you save quite a lot of, uh, of final demand. On the other side, with the molecule scenario uh, there, we, we went less uh, into the electrification, but it results indeed in a higher final energy demand uh, for your system. And so this was done for the whole Europe uh, here um, for the demand. So this is one part of the story. Um, on the next slide, I think we detail a bit more the assumptions that we have taken. Uh, so this is only represents a part. So as I said, you first need to take assumptions on how much will the uh, final heating demand decrease. So this is what you see here for the two first lines, huh? decrease in heating demand per dwelling or increase in electricity demand for appliances. So this is always the same for each of the scenarios. So we have not made variations on, for instance, the need for heating the buildings or the amount of kilometers that will be driven. So the only variation between electricity and molecule scenario uh, is really about the final technology uh, that is used in the end. Yeah. And so for the final technology for heating, um, one, the main one is the heat pumps that is you, are used. So whether it's for residential or tertiary heating, we have taken ranges between 30%, 75% uh, for the heat pumps for residential. You see also that for the tertiary, we went between 45 and 80%. Yes, yeah, so for 45, of course, for the scenario, which is more molecule based, 80% for the scenario, which is more reliant on electricity. The same for the transport. And what you see here for the transport, we also made uh, an assumptions on, for instance, how much of the EVs uh, are electrified or not. Um, what you what we took as assumptions, of course, for passenger cars, it could go up to 100%. We see already the trend taking up uh, uh, very quickly in, 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 to, uh, in this year or even the, the year before. So between 70 and 100%. And of course, for buses and trucks uh, there, uh, we also took assumptions, for instance, for trucks between five and ninety percent of of the of the um, of the fleet that could be electrified. Um, this result uh, also last part, last but not least, industry, which is sometimes uh, forgotten. Huh? We always focus yeah, heat pumps and EVs, but industry is quite a big part of 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 our energy consumption, and specifically for Belgium, uh, there also we took some assumptions per sector, uh, and the, the electrification rate uh, is between 44 and 75 percent on European scale, um, and this lead in total, uh, as you saw already on the previous slide, between 45 and 70 percent. Uh, electrification rate. So just short, shortly again, we took always the same assumption in terms of final, I would say, uh, service provided, yeah, but we made variations on the type of technology that provided the service. And this is the distinction between both of the scenarios. On the next slide, so I've talked about the demand, yeah, and you can find back the demand on the left part of the chart. So on you find this, uh, you find here back for the elec and the molecule scenario, the electricity or what we call the direct electricity consumption. Um, those are the same numbers as you saw before. But what we've added here is what would be the electricity uh, consumption needed to produce the green molecule. So if you saw in the in the previous slides, um, showed how much uh, molecules you would need in the different scenarios, whether it's hydrogen, could be uh, e-fuels. We have also quantified, okay, how much energy, uh, how much electricity do you need to produce those molecules? Because in the end, uh, if you want to produce green molecules, uh, the, the primary fuel uh, to be used is electricity. And you see here for the electricity elect scenario and the molecule scenario, the first thing that you can see is that indeed, between both of the scenarios, of course, the electric electricity consumption is different, but in the molecule scenario, given that you need to replace, uh, that, that you replace part of the electricity consumption that you assume in the electricity scenario by molecules, uh, and that the final demand is higher because you use less efficient devices, you have a difference between, I think it's 1,800 terawatt hours that you see on the slide. This corresponds to around, I think, 400 gigawatt of offshore wind generation. Huh? Just to give you an idea, which is corresponds actually to the to the ambitions of the European Commission with regards to the offshore. So you have already a different, um, let's say, total electricity that would we need. But we don't say that this should be produced in Europe. This could also be imported for part of the uh, of the green molecules. But still, it gives you an indication on the uh, on the challenge that it requires. And on the right side, you have the supply scenarios. So what we have done here is that we, we took assumptions, or we looked at different studies, national studies, European studies, to assess, okay, what is the potential in terms of PV, wind offshore, and wind onshore generation in Europe? And we took there uh, different, uh, so different pace of, of, 
uh, you can I mean you can summarize it as a different pace of, of, of development. So BIU 1.5, so business as usual times 1.5 means that okay, we have looked at the, the rate, the growth rate of renewables in the past five years, and we multiply by 1.5. The BAU three times is you multiply by three and BAU, BAU four times you multiply by four. You also have the capacities on the on the bottom of the slide. So for instance, BAU times three corresponds to around 400 gigawatts of offshore wind, 580 onshore and 1,200 gigawatts of, of PV capacity. These are huge amounts uh, at, at European level. Uh, what you see indeed that in any case you will need to increase uh, the, the the pace of of of, uh, of rest development uh, in Europe because as you see if you want to meet at least your electricity demand with a renewable capacity uh, you need to 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 increase uh, the pace and if you want to meet the electricity demand in the elect scenario you need to do it uh, three times more than what you do today uh, and this again you only meet the electricity demand you don't meet yet the electricity that is required to produce uh, the green molecules uh, this being said um, on the next slide what you see of course this is at european level uh, um, we have of course do, done that for every country and what you could see is that there is a mismatch between what is available uh, in, for instance, the Nordic countries, uh, Central Europe, uh, South of Europe, um, in terms of rest uh, compared to their demands. And what you see on this chart is that the, the countries or the regions that are in, in, in dark uh, blue or, 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 or green, depends on, uh, uh, on how do you interpret the colors, um, are, are countries or regions that are, have uh, excess of, of rest supply. And you see that those are concentrated mainly around the North Sea, huh? so big offshore wind, hydro in the Nordics, uh, the UK, uh, also to a certain extent France and uh, Spain, with their more uh, onshore and PV potential. But the rest of Europe, and this is where Belgium is also included, and Germany, uh, you see actually there are both countries uh, dark um, orange are short in rest supply, so they will need imports to meet their final demand. This is also the case for Italy or for uh, Central or Balkan countries uh, in Europe. So the, it's not distributed evenly across Europe. So even if I would say uh, you could meet the demand on a yearly level uh, for Europe, you, you might not do it for, for every country. And so interconnections will be key to deliver uh, the uh, the different excess, I mean, to, to, to enhance the different excess of supply between the countries. Um, so for Belgium, you are in under supply. And I think on the next line, you will see that more into detail. So the same for Belgium as for Europe, uh, you see the same kind of chart. Um, again, on the left part, the, uh, the demand. So electricity and what if you would produce all the needed molecules uh, uh, with electricity, we don't say again that this part in in in, uh, in green should be produced in Belgium, and you will see that is almost uh, impossible given the rest potential in Belgium. I will not teach you anything telling you that okay we are a highly dense dense density. Uh, population country. We have a very short area in the North Sea, or rest potential is quite limited. Um, it's between 70, 100, 110 uh, terawatt hours. Um, this is, of course, only if you count the, the offshore, onshore and PV that you could install in Belgium. Um, if you compare this to the demand, uh, in any case, you are short uh, for, for your total demand and, of course, even more for electricity. So you will need to import. You will need to import electricity uh, for your electric, electric part, but you will also need to import the green molecules that you will need to for the other uh, sectors that can't be easily electrified. So short in rest. Um, for Belgium, this is also the case to a certain extent to Germany um, that we've also analyzed in the study. And the last one, I think, um, before the questions, if I'm not mistaken. So this is simply the key figures that you found back or that I quickly explained. Uh, so first of all, we found that direct electrification, this is really the most efficient way to meet the energy demand. So as I said, there are devices or technologies that are already existing today that allow you really to make savings in your final uh, uh, final energy demand. And this corresponds to around 1,800 terawatt hours. So again, to give an example, this is around 400 gigawatt of, of, of offshore wind generation uh, in Europe. Um, rest expansion needs to really uh, accelerate, uh, triple, if you want to meet the electricity demand uh, in the elect scenario. And this is three times what we are doing today. So really need to accelerate the expansion uh, to enable and to change the policies 
uh, around that. And then the close cooperation in Europe is really key also, and I would say for Belgium even more, given that we are really a country short on renewables. So to build partnership with other countries for electricity, for the molecules, um, to be able to decarbonize our economy and or actually our society, uh, because we won't be able to do it alone. Um, and this is the case for Belgium, but this is also the case for many other countries in our continent. I hope it was clear. I don't know, Jan, how do we proceed with the questions? Uh, thank you, Raphael. I will now share my screen and then we can tackle the questions uh, one by one. Um, so again, a warm invite to all participants. Feel free to ask questions. Um, we have normally sufficient time to answer all of them. Um, so a first question from uh, Janus de Bond from Baringa, if I'm not mistaken. Many congrats on the impressive study. Could you elaborate a bit on the tooling used for the supply demand modeling and whether it's developed in-house or not? Uh, yes, I, I can answer the question, of course. Uh, so um, supply and demand modeling. So the first part on a yearly level, this is, of course, this is in-house uh, in -house developed. Uh, but of course, the challenge uh, are the two other parts. Huh? So the market simulation, we use Antares, which is an economic dispatch tool that we also use in other contexts at Alia or Alia Group, uh, for instance, for the, the adequacy studies or for uh, it's also used by NSOE uh, for the 10-year network development plan uh, for the European resource adequacy assessment. So that's one of the tools. And the Fourier tool, if I'm not mistaken, it was also developed in-house uh, um, by, uh, by colleagues from, uh, from uh, 50 years. Yes. Okay. Then the next question from uh, Pierre Clairbois on what do we actually mean with a copper plate? So a, a copper plate is a simulation where you assume that you have infinite uh, interconnection capacity between the countries. It's a theoretical case. Uh, but it can already allow you to check whether in copper plate. So assuming that uh, Portugal is has infinite capacity with Poland, I would say. Uh, what is the impact, for instance, on on the, on the need for backup capacity uh, uh, or for flexibility? Okay, and if I'm not mistaken, in our study, we take two kind of grids into account. So first one comes from the NSOE 10-year network development plan for 2040, which we could see like a limited grid, let's say it's still ambitious, but limited for 2050 purposes. And on the other hand, we do the copper plate. And by doing these two scenarios, I think we have a nice range of what the effect of more or less grid is on, on the outcome, if, if I'm not mistaken. Well, then we have a question from um, Ruben Lallemand. Um, what is the scale of the need for new more interconnectors on European level and or on Belgian level? What were the assumptions for this uh, in the two scenarios, Molecule and ELEC? Uh, so if I understand well the question, um, I don't know if we will present that, but in the study we'll find back what would uh, I think in figure 14 in the study that is published, you can find a bit a uh, high level assessment of what would be the interconnection capacity be needed if you want to reach a kind of a copper plate scenario. So that shows a bit the need for interconnections. No, the, the interconnections, so the amount of interconnections we assume between countries, it's a sense, it's a it's a parameter we varied as uh, as explained Jan. So between uh, an IOSN plus scenario, which is like an expected grid for, for, for 2040 and the copper plate, so it's, it was assessed between countries. So in, maybe in our simulation, maybe to explain it otherwise, in our simulation, what every country is one zone. So every country is copper plates. Yeah. So Belgium, whether you are in Ostend or in Arlon, uh, uh, you have the same. Uh, I mean, there is no constraint between both both cities, let's say. But between countries, uh, we took assumptions of interconnection capacity. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, Okay. Then the next question from uh, Victor Mouton about the import of green molecules. Won't the import of green molecules cause an electron shortage in countries like Namibia, Oman, and Chile? 
Hence, will there be green molecules available for export in those countries when, as long as those countries are not zero, uh, not net zero yet? I think, yeah, if it's OK, I can start already. Uh, but I think it's a very valid question. That's also why we see that renewable energy is scarce towards uh, 2050. And so um, electrification in that sense would reduce the need for this import already. Um, uh, but uh, indeed, uh, having imports from, from those countries, which might still be short on the long term on renewable energies, uh, might be a, a complex matter. And then it's also up to um, regulations to define what is actually classified as green molecules. But for now, I think from our perspective, um, we would follow more what the, the, the classifications would be from the regulations. OK, then next question is from Ivo van Isterdaal. CO2 for, uh, free production of electricity means renewables only or also nuclear like France. Who is going to tackle that one? Uh, I can tackle it. Huh? Yeah, indeed, we also consider nuclear for the countries where uh, uh, it is planned. So we took into account uh, for France, but also for other countries like the UK, uh, nuclear capacities uh, based on the on the on the data. Uh, and so we also use this uh, for the long term scenarios that they use. So it's also included in the in the scenarios uh, that we simulated. Okay, then the next question from Victor Mouton. Were the limitations caused by congestion on the distribution grid taken into account in the iOS N plus uh, scenario? As explained, uh, no, because uh, we, so the, the granularity of our modeling is at country level. So the SO congestions are not taken into account uh, in this study. So I think uh, that's, yeah, that's a short answer. Uh, and I think also the long one, because there is no, that's the, the, the way that we, we model things. So only interconnection capacity uh, as a constraint between the countries. Yeah, and on top of that, one of the conclusions I think from our study, and especially on getting access to flexibility at end user site, is that we need to digitalize so that end users get engaged to consume energy when there is renewables in, in the grid. Um, but as well, this digitalization should allow to manage congestions, both in transmission and distribution grid in, in a dynamic way. So it is something that we know that is important and we hope that digitalization will enable or will be able allow us to to manage uh, these kind of congestions together with, of course, the distribution grid operators who are responsible for that. OK, then we have another question from Janus de Bond. How are uh, renewable production capacities allocated among the different European countries in the study, leading then to deficits and surpluses? Would Germany remain a deficit country following the recent increases in targets? Um, maybe the first one, Raphael or Louis, can you tackle it? And then I think we also have our colleague uh, Paul Namacher from Funzi Hertz in this call. So maybe on the, the last part on Germany, uh, you could elaborate a bit. Yeah, I can elaborate on the on the on the first part or or, or, or my colleague. But yeah, indeed. So it, we looked at different uh, studies. Huh? So it's not only uh, so different study national studies, but also European studies uh, on potentials on uh, what our neighbors do, huh? like RT, also the studies in the UK, uh, Germany, uh, etc. We've cross checked that. So the, the the values that we use or the distribution are based on those on those uh, national or European studies. So that's how it was allocated. Uh, I would I would say across Europe, and then I don't know, Paul. Yeah, maybe for Germany, um, the the targets that were now defined for for 2030 mainly, but for offshore also going until 2045, they are still within the range of of our scenario. So um, we see in our study going uh, towards 2050 um, that that you need these capacities and even. Um, more and and uh, yeah, so so even taking into account these targets, um, it's likely that 
Germany will remain or will become a net importer of of electricity or will need um, yeah non domestic renewable resources. For example, now um, what we do with Denmark, the Bornholm Energy Island, where where we use this offshore generation as well. Okay. Then the next question from uh, Sarge Swinnen. Uh, what is the energy demand for the different sectors, industry, transport, buildings in 2020 and in 2050? Kerstin, if I'm not mistaken, we have included a slide in the annex. So maybe you could take over the screen for a minute and show that. Yeah, maybe in the meanwhile, you could go to the next question and then uh, yeah. I will share my screen. Uh, OK, afterwards. perfect. So next question from Pierre Bayard. Hello, was the option considered of importing green electricity molecules from outside Europe, wind out UK, PV from North Africa, for instance? Um, well, uh, and on the slide deck and uh, the entire document, it will be made available on the website as well as this recording. So yeah, importing electricity from outside UK, uh, from outside Europe. Did we consider it? Yes or no? Who can tackle that one? I can tackle it. Huh? So um, in the modeling, we have not considered any, I would say, connections with North Africa, uh, uh, for instance. So you uh, went in UK. So UK, Norway, and 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 Switzerland were were modeled. So there is you have PV wind as well available and interconnections, but we stopped or at the I would say Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so the 27 uh, European Union countries and uh, Norway, UK, and and, uh, and Switzerland. No, uh, for for the green molecules, uh, as you already said, uh, you could indeed, as you don't have enough rest in Europe to be pro that they are produced in Europe, you will need to consider importing them. From from outside of Europe. So it's not something that we have looked into details from where, at what cost. Uh, that was a bit out of scope of the study, uh, but this is something that we indeed will need to be considered if you want to reach carbon neutrality uh, for Europe. Okay, and then I think, uh, Kerstin, we can tackle the next two questions directly yes. with going to the annex. Uh, the first is on the energy demand of the different sectors. And the other one, I think in Annex, we also included the assumption on interconnection for Belgium. And as Raphael mentioned before, um, the market exchanges that we would see in the business as usual times uh, time three ELEC scenario. So, yeah. Yes, uh, I think here is the, the, the demand for the different sectors. Um, I don't know, Rafael or Louis, if you want to go a little bit more into detail there. Um, yeah, so on, I, on this graph, we uh, il illustrate the, the total electricity demand for Belgium in, in 2050 in the different scenarios, and we compare this uh, this value to the amount uh, in uh, uh, yeah on uh, of today, so around 90 uh, uh, terawatt hours, and um, so. The, the first the first block is the direct electrification. So the, the we see that there is a an increase of the the direct electrification in uh, in the different scenarios. So in both the the molecular and the elect scenarios, and the yellow part on top is the what we call the indirect uh, electrification. So it's the green molecules that need to be produced, yeah, that need to be produced or imported, but that are needed um, for the for the Belgium system, and that so that need to be uh, yeah, produced uh, produced somehow. And so that we, yeah, here we have the the details by uh, by sectors with the uh, uh, taking into account the different uh, assumptions that we that we took regarding the the electrification in the industry sectors, uh, the the assumptions that we took for for eating or for transport. Perfect. Thank okay. You. And then maybe a last question and the rest of the questions we will tackle uh, offline and we will get back to you, but conscious of timing. So it is a question of Ruben Lallemand to, to have a clear view on the level of interconnection for Belgium that we assumed in our model and also then the market exchanges that might give an idea of how much renewables we need to get to Belgium to satisfy the electricity demands uh, in the ELECA pathway. So, Kerstin, can you show uh, 
these slides. And I don't know, Louis or Raphael, if you can elaborate on that. Yes, indeed. So uh, regarding the grid configuration, we consider for, for Belgium. So in the IFSN plus grid configuration, so it comes from the TNDP 2020 and it's the it's based on the identification of system needs from the TNDP for the year 2040. Um, so yeah, it's, um, Ali, uh, let's call it a limited grid for 20, 2050. And uh, on top of this grid from the from the TNDP, um, we add some of uh, new projects. So we have uh, two gigawatt of interconnection also with uh, with Denmark, so to the hybrid interconnections between the uh, the two energy islands. And we also assume that there is an, an additional capacity to to UK. So basically, the the Nautilus um, uh, the Nautilus link. Um, so these two projects are added on top of the grid uh, the grid IOSN. Um, from the TNDP. And if I may complement Louis, uh, you see if you make the sum of the different, uh, so if the question Ruben was uh, how much, so if you make the sum, I think you arrive at 15 gigawatts, if I'm not mistaken or something, and that we see that indeed, if you compare uh, LX scenario with, for instance, BIU uh, three times, so the rest you need around 70 terawatt hours or something like that, which correspond between 15 and 20 gigawatts. So you will need, of course, this grid, but you also might need to go and find more uh, renewables, for instance, direct connections to wind farms in the North Sea, uh, and further develop that uh, to indeed in the, uh, to allow that imports to be uh, for, I mean, electrically connected to Belgium to decarbonize the, the electric system in Belgium as well. Okay, thank you. Then I propose to move to the second block of the presentation, which is on flexibility. So, Kirsten, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so, so let's now move on to, to this block on, on flexibility. Before we dive into the more details, I want to already give you an overview of the, the, the second insight. And, and so what we see is that indeed renewable energies themselves, they come with some inherent fluctuations. Um, however, when we have a, a renewable energy system, which is, uh, or an electricity system that's intelligently designed, well designed, we can actually manage these fluctuations in an efficient way. So, uh, Rafael already explained this in the beginning, uh, but based on the Fourier tool, we actually split up these fluctuations on three different levels. So, we have uh, seasonal fluctuations. Uh, where we see also that a well-balanced rest mix uh, can provide already um, a, a, a lot of support. And then secondly, we have the midterm fluctuations, um, and there we see that sharing those midterm fluctuations and those having more interconnections um, also to uh, decorrelated wind zones will help a lot in order to, to mitigate the impact of um, these fluctuations. And then finally, on a daily level, um, there is really the electrification of end use and then also digitalizing these assets in order to be able to use them in a flexible way, already a, a, an important factor in order to, to resolve uh, the, the, the potential issues that could come from this. So those are a little bit the three different uh, important elements that we will go through. Um, and so I, I, I think I touched upon most of the elements, but to go a little bit more into detail here. Um, so the fluctuations themselves, so like I explained, we have to split them up into three uh, different time frames, and then we still have the adequacy part uh, uh, in addition, which will be explained a little bit later by Louis in more detail. So I will focus on the, the three first elements, so the daily fluctuations, and, and there you can see that they are mainly driven by solar. So what does it mean actually a daily fluctuation well with solar you have high production during the day and uh, no production during the night so you have a, a daily fluctuation which means that you have a fluctuation um, happening between uh, 1 to 24 hours then sticking with the example of solar uh, when we look at the production on a seasonal level what we see is that there is a lot more production in summer uh, when the sun is shining a lot more and more intensely in comparison with the winter. So there you can also see a, a seasonal effect. So having a higher production during summer in comparison with winter. 
In between those two fluctuations, you come with the weekly to monthly fluctuations, and, and these are not driven by solar, but are driven by wind. So what there happens is that you have weeks with a high level of wind production, who are then followed by weeks with a low level of wind production. And so for all of these uh, three different types of fluctuations, we investigated them a little bit more into detail and also wanted to provide some, some interesting solutions or, or ways uh, to, to, to mitigate the impact of these fluctuations a little bit better. And so let's now start with the seasonal fluctuations. So what you can see here is the seasonal component of uh, the, the time series from all the different renewable energy technologies and also of the load itself. So on the bottom of the graph, you can see uh, wind onshore, wind offshore and solar. And so for solar, I already explained a little bit what the impact is. So you have a higher production in summer, lower production in winter. What you can see for uh, wind production, the inverse is actually true. So there you have a, a higher production in the winter than in the summer. And this means that the, the, these production technologies are actually quite complementary. Now, looking at the, uh, the top of this graph, you can actually see again two different lines. So we have the red line, which is the sum of the seasonal components of uh, the three different REST technologies. And then you also have the black line, which is the load or electricity demand throughout the year. And based on the REST mix that was defined in the business as usual times three scenario, we can actually see that uh, on average uh, or, or almost a whole year uh, long, there is sufficient renewable energy being produced in order to cover the electricity demand. There are a couple of uh, weeks, uh, days and weeks where you see that there is a slightly higher demand than production, but certainly there is no need for a, a, a massive amount of, of seasonal storage in order to be able to transfer the energy between uh, the winter and the summer. And, and, and so that's also really what we see when we have a well-designed system, when we have a well-balanced rest mix, we can actually limit really the need for seasonal storage and, and have a, a electricity system that is very balanced. Now, of course, this is on a European level, and it is also interesting to, to zoom in more on, on the Belgian uh, example. Um, uh, Raphael already explained this uh, previously, but what you can see is that Belgium is short on renewable electricity. Um, so we can uh, approximately provide 50% uh, of uh, our own renewable electricity and the rest would need to come from non-domestic uh, resources. And when we are looking at the, the, the current REST mix or the REST mix that we can provide domestically in which we defined in the, um, uh, in the business as usual times three scenario, you can see that already 25% of the electricity will be provided by solar. And so when we then analyze this in a more on a more detailed level, you can see actually that this uh, amount of solar is almost already the uh, maximum amount of solar that we can integrate effectively into the electricity system. To explain this a little bit more into detail, we, we made an example case of two theoretical scenarios um, where we show how to best fill in the gap with the um, uh, electricity demand or from the electricity demand because Belgium is short on renewable energy. So to start off on the left hand side, we again have the base case. So where we have uh, a shortage of approximately nine gigawatts of renewable energy, which needs to be filled in by non-domestic uh, renewable energy resources. So we propose two different theoretical scenarios how to fill in this gap. So um, in the first scenario, we add 18 gigawatt of non-domestic offshore wind energy to the mix and, and look at the seasonal component. And then a second scenario where we add still 10 gigawatts of uh, offshore wind production, also non-domestic, but this is then complemented also by 30 gigawatts of solar uh, energy. And it's quite visual already what you can see in the difference between the two. So in the uh, offshore scenario, you see actually that there is almost no seasonal uh, spread anymore, and, and thus that there is almost no need uh, for a uh, seasonal transfer and thus a season long flexibility need. 
looking, however, at the uh, other example, more on the uh, amount of, or when we are adding uh, also solar to the energy system, you can see that a seasonal spread again uh, appears and that there's thus a need to transfer the energy from summer to winter. Uh, and this also comes with high uh, conversion losses. So in the end, this is actually something that, uh, if possible, we would like to avoid. So that's a little bit more into detail on the, the difference and also the impact on the seasonal component. Now, moving to the second level, um, more on the weekly to monthly fluctuations, what we see um, there, like I explained, uh, these are mainly driven by the production of, uh, of wind energy. Um, and so here, what we did was to take the example of um, wind and offshore wind energy and looked actually at uh, how often the wind energy in Belgium is pro being produced uh, at the same time as that wind energy is being produced at uh, our close neighbors. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but what you can actually uh, see is that the higher that the number is, the more often that wind is being produced or wind uh, energy is being produced in Belgium at the same time as in those locations. And this is something that we would like to avoid because we actually want to level out the fluctuations. So having production in Belgium at the same time as having production in these other locations is actually uh, not something that we would like to have. So our close neighbors still have a quite high number. So you can see the uh, south of the UK or the Netherlands. There we have high numbers. However, if we move away a little bit further, so looking at Denmark, Norway, also the south of the UK, uh, north of the UK, sorry, there you can see actually that the, the, there is a decorrelation that happens. And this, this means that the, the chance is a lot higher that um, there is wind energy being produced at those locations when there is no wind production in Belgium. And, and the, looking now at the, 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 the bar chart on the left, the impact is actually that you can reduce um, your uh, flexibility needs by almost 50% by having a, a well interconnected system and thus a system that's able to share these fluctuations coming from uh, the, the, the production of wind. So really having them, this uh, already uh, uh, reduces the need for flexibility. So now moving to the, the, the final uh, flexibility um, resource or, or flexibility timeframe is the short term flexibility. And, and there, I already explained it as well in the beginning, that um, there is more uh, production of solar in summer than in winter. And actually, when we look at it, um, there is also a overproduction during the day and not enough production during the night. And so what we see there is that when we have short term flexibility resources, which can uh, consume energy during the day or store energy during the day and then release this back during the night, we can actually integrate a lot more renewable energy and thus also help the electricity system to be uh, a lot more efficient. And in order to be able to quantify this a little bit further, we uh, did an analysis to see in two different scenarios um, how the flexibility would actually impact um, the uh, oversupply and undersupply in the electricity system. And so on the left-hand side, you see a low flex scenario this means that there is a limited amount of flexibility which is available in the electricity system and a high flex scenario where there is a higher amount of flexibility available. And then focusing on uh, the middle of the graph where you can see the number of days with over and under supply. So these are days when there is too much energy during the day and too little energy during the night. And in, in such a scenario where there's a limited amount of flexibility available, this really happens a lot. So in 44% of the days, you have end oversupply and under supply. However, now looking at uh, a high flex scenario, you can actually reduce these uh, days or the number of these days quite significantly. So there is almost uh, no days left. There's uh, only 4% of the days would still have over and under supply. And the other days are spread uh, over the different uh, other time frames. So either having uh, still too much energy, having too little energy, or being in a case where they are in balance between the days. So there again, the short-term flexibility can resolve a large amount of the daily fluctuations. 
help with the integration of renewable energy. And there, there's also the electrification of end use and then also the digitalization of end use will play a very important role uh, in order to make this a reality. So that was a quick run through of the, the different elements on the flexibility part. And then if there are any questions, um, please don't hesitate. Yeah, thank you, Gerson. I will share my screen to show the questions. We only have two of them, so please feel free to, to introduce more questions. Um, the first question is from uh, Cyril Cousin. Is the impact of the reduction of grid inertia due to the reduced number of rotational generators on the flexibility needed to guarantee a frequency stability studied, or is this kind of flexibility not taken into account in this study? Uh, I think it's a very relevant question. Uh, we didn't take inertia into account in this study, but indeed the reduction of the amount of synchronous generators will uh, cause some challenges on that topic, but that's out of scope of this study. However, there are solutions uh, for that also um, to, to be investigated. Then we have the second question of Ruben Lallemand, which is on the high level of seasonal variation. In adequacy studies of Elia, there was always an in-depth look at Dunkelflaute. This is not the case here, where Elia is using averages to spread out the production. What if there are uh, two or three weeks without wind in the North Sea area? This could happen in the middle of the winter. I think it's a very valid question. I think the third block of the presentation will exactly go on this Dunkelflaute event and what is needed uh, to, to survive these events to keep the lights on. So indeed, it's not treated in this block of flexibility. It will be treated later on. So if you have still questions in the third block, then please feel free to re-ask. Then a question from Alexander Bosman, uh, slide 23. Can you give examples of flexible consumers? Where do you see the biggest potential? So who is going to tackle that question? I can already start. So uh, I think the largest part of flexibility resources that we have added are coming from end users. So this means that um, either the use of electric vehicles, um, which have a, a high amount of uh, battery capacity, uh, in addition to also a, a quite strong connection. If you, you look at a um, 2050 system where you will have around 5 million electric vehicles driving around, you can have a very large battery. Um, in addition to that, you also have um, heat pumps which have a, a potential to also shift their consumption uh, a couple of hours. So yeah, of course, uh, we did take into account that uh, consumer behavior would not need to change in order to uh, have this flexibility available. But thanks to the thermal inertia of houses um, and also the, yeah, the, the bigger capacity of vehicles than you would typically need on a day, you actually have a, a large amount of flexibility at your disposition. Uh, next to that, we also looked at uh, a limited amount of uh, flexibility coming from industry. However, this flexibility comes um, at a higher cost, so it's going to go into competition with other resources um, at a later stage. So this flexibility is activated only at a later moment in time. Okay. Thank you, Kerstin. Then a question from uh, Victor Mouton. What is the biggest challenge in, Bel in Belgium regarding tripling the amount of renewables, onshore wind, offshore wind, or solar? Uh, so, Raphael, can you take this one? Yes, I can. It's a tricky question, of course, but uh, don't think that there is one more challenging than the other and for different reasons. I guess the challenge is different depending on the type. So, onshore wind, it's public acceptance, the main challenge, I would say, uh, because yeah, the impact of, of the windmills uh, uh, and you see many, many permit, uh, you need permitting, you have a lot of uh, uh, NIMBY effect huh, for onshore wind. Uh, PV, you have indeed less NIMBY effect, but you might have other issues, mainly on distribution level uh, that might arise if you have a lot of penetration of PV panels. And for offshore wind, this is uh, also very challenging in terms of high voltage infrastructure. So bringing back the wind to the land, it's also quite uh, 
a big challenge uh, and also regarding public acceptance because you might also need to 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 go deeper in the land but also simply to connect uh, that to to the land so uh, there is no one that is more challenging than the other i would say so okay thank you rafael then we have a question from rafael mero the energy transition as described in the presentation will also happen at DSO levels. Were DSOs involved in this exercise? Um, at the initial stages, we uh, mainly wanted to set a framework for ourselves to also be able to, to go then further into detail and to uh, have a, a more detailed description to, to, to really have a basis to start working from. And I think the major challenge over there, and, and that's also what, what we presented before, is electrification of end use and also the activation of flexibility. And those are topics where, for example, in the Internet of Energy uh, platform, etc., we are working together uh, with DSOs on, on these kind of topics. So indeed, uh, energy transition will happen in, in all the grids and we will need to work together to, to make this happen uh, for sure. Okay, then we have a question from Peter Klaas. What if neighboring countries such as Germany and the Netherlands follow the same strategy and try to import from the North Sea at the same time? Will there be sufficient peak capacity for all? Who will take this question? I can, dis can take this question, uh, but because it's also, uh, it will be more related to the, uh, to the third side on the, um, on adequacy, but yeah, in the in the study we see that with the uh, with the the right amount of uh, of flexibility and with sufficient uh, interconnection level, we can already level out this uh, yeah this yeah peaking effect or this uh, this um, this lack of uh, renewable uh, um, uh, generation available. But yeah, that will be uh, I further explain in the in the third part of the of the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Louis. Then we have a question from uh, Patrick Vincent. Slide 23 mentions the situation in Germany. Is a similar scenario applicable for Belgium? Who can take this one? Oh yeah, I can take the question. Yeah, indeed. So, so the scenario is indeed uh, similar in, in in Belgium. So um, the, the the conclusions there are certainly also applicable uh, in, in in Belgium. Certainly, given the high amounts of uh, solar energy in the electricity system there. Okay, and then we have a last question from uh, Victor Mouton. Regarding end consumer flexibility, who need to consume electricity when the share of rest in the mix is high? How will they know when it is high? How will they be incentivized? I think there, yeah, Elia also uh, published a, a white paper recently on a consumer centric market design where there will be more participation of end users into the electricity system itself. And there are also some uh, proposition on, uh, propositions on, on how they uh, could optimize their uh, electricity consumption a little bit more in order to help with the integration of renewable energy. I think today electricity price might already be one element that can show whether there's lots of renewables in the grid, yes or no, uh, if at least they, they set a price. But we are fully aware that engaging these end consumers to, to really act towards the signal and, and to enable them to participate in the market, that that's uh, a really big challenge. And so we are working on that and digitalization hopefully will be able to, to accommodate that. But it's not only end consumers and not only the, the small retail end consumers, the signals can also be for industry and actually any consumer of electricity. So we need to get everyone in the electricity system more active uh, to realize this paradigm shift from generation follows demand to demand follows uh, generation where possible, of course. Voila, that was the last question on this part. So then I suggest uh, to move to the last block. And if I'm not mistaken, Louis, you are going to present that one. 
Yes, indeed, I will present this uh, third key insight on uh, adequacy. So, a bit to remind the, the the process. So, in the in the first insight, we we defined the, the transformation pathway. So, basically, the the demand and the and the supply data. Uh, then we introduced the um, uh, the different tools that we that we use. So, the market simulation on one hand, and on the other hand, the full analysis, which allow us, among others, to provide the uh, assessments of the impact of the flexibility means, which was the second insight. And the third insight um, is dedicated to the, the adequacy assessment uh, by taking into account also different level of, uh, of flexibility and different uh, grid configuration as introduced by, by Rafael at the start. Um, so here, what do we um, what do we mean by adequacy assessments? So we speak about an iterative process, which consists in um, adding, uh, adding backup capacities until we reach um, an adequate system at European level. Um, so we speak about uh, backup capacity, um, but we do not make any choice regarding the, the technology will, which will be needed to, uh, to cover this need. Um, indeed, there is uh, different uh, climate neutral technologies which are, uh, which are available and, and that could um, uh, meet uh, this, um, this need, such as um, a hydrogen fired gas, uh, gas turbine, a fuel cell, some, um, some uh, biomass also, and so on. Um, some of these technology are already mature, uh, but yeah, od uh, others are still under under development, and so on the way to uh, to 2050, um, we do not make any any choices uh, regarding the the technology. So now going to the um, uh, to the um, to the ad adequacy assessments. So the first step was to uh, identify the uh, the need for this backup capacity. So in order to to do so, um, we first can look at the at the load feeling for a, a typical summer periods in Belgium. So in order to do this, we we took a scenario with the um, helix demand scenario with um, a value times three risk supply scenario. So um, um, let's call a moderate risk supply, a limited grid, and a high level of uh, flexibility. And uh, from this um, from this load feeling, we see, we saw that during periods with um, low risk in feed and with a limited grid, um, we observe that there is um, typically when there is no uh, no solar and no wind available, that the uh, the imports will also be yeah more limited, and that the flexibility will provide uh, less uh, added value to the to the system. And so in those periods, which are marked in in um, in purple on this graph. Uh, we see that there is a need for the the backup capacity to to run in order to have um, an adequate system. Um, another way to um, to illustrate this need for backup capacity is to take uh, also the um, so the the graph which was introduced in the in the second insight um, by taking into account the distribution of days across the year. Uh, in this case, for Germany, so here we took a scenario with the high uh, the high flexibility. And um, a copper plate, so all the links sets to uh, to infinite. And what do we see? We see that um, with this high level of flexibility and this strong uh, European interconnection, um, all the uh, intraday variations um, are solved. So that's what we saw with the the zero percent um, in the center of the graph. Um, and a part of the weekly uh, variation are also solved. Um, however, we saw so on the left part of the graph that there is still some periods with um, at least one hour of undersupply during the day. Um, so that's what we that's the 90 percent that we that we have. And um, uh, during those moments, the backup capacity will be required um, in order to to ensure adequacy um, during the during those days. So um, this is. Uh, in order to identif uh, identify the, um, the need for the backup capacity. So the next question is, when does the uh, scarcity situation occur? So that's what we will um, illustrate on the next graph, which show, um, which is also related to the, the Dunkel flood situations, which were um, asked in the, in, the, in the chat before. So what we see is that the uh, scarcity situation are, are mainly correlated by the uh, by the rest gen um, generation, and uh, they mainly occur so in case of a prolonged situation of uh, low risk in feed. 
So on the on the left graph, what we see is the occurrences of low wind generation events on average per year in Germany. And so we see that the the long the long length uh, events mainly occur are mainly correlated to uh, to onshore wind, which means yeah, in this case that for Germany, having a large share of offshore wind in the mix, um, yeah, we reduce the occurrences and the and the length of these low risk events in the German power system. And on the right part, we have the so the same um, kind of graph with but with the total uh, risk generation, um, and we have first the value for uh, countries uh, isolated, so for Belgium and Germany. And in this uh, in this case, we see that um, there is still some uh, there are a lot of events um, with low risk in feed, and these events um, will be uh, covered by the. Uh, we will need to be fulfilled by the, the backup uh, capacities. Um, then when we look at the, um, the European level, so it's the it's the blue uh, the blue part of the of the chart, uh, we see that the long periods of low risk in feed uh, will yeah we will arrive occur simultaneously across Europe. So there is a, a kind of pooling effect and which lead to um, almost no low rest in feed uh, longer than than four days which means that with a strong interconnection across the across Europe the uh, occurrence of extreme uh, events will be um, uh, will be uh, balanced and we will reduce the need for this uh, backup capacities um, then the third question uh, is the, the quantification of this need for, for backup capacity. So in order to, to do that, we uh, took again the same uh, scenario. So the um, electric um, uh, demands and the value times three uh, uh, rest supply, and we look at different sensitivities. So we look at sensitivities regarding the level of flexibility and regarding the, the grid with a limited grid. So the grid IOSN plus and um, the copper plate uh, configuration. So what we saw is that um, with low flex and the grid uh, IOSN, there is a need of more or less for uh, 400 uh, gigawatts of, um, of backup capacity required at European level, and that this amount can already be reduced by 100 gigawatts by uh, taking into account um, uh, more flexibility in the in the system. So by yeah, developing the end user flexibility. Um, and then this um, this level of uh, backup capacity can again be reduced by uh, more or less 60 gigawatts um, by taking into account a strong European interconnection. Um, so with the with the with the copper plate. So um, those are the values at European level. And then if we look uh, the estimated required backup capacity uh, at Belgium level, we see that there is a need um, between 7.5 and 15 uh, gigawatts for the for the Belgium system. Um, so this was for the for the installed uh, capacity. No, in terms of uh, running hours. So again, we uh, took a certain uh, a certain scenario to illustrate this. So in this case, um, we took a scenario with the limited grid, so the grid IOSN plus, and a high amount. Of, uh, of flexibility, and what we see on this graph, it's with the the dotted points, the um, uh, the um, the average values of generation for this backup capacity um, for each uh, each month of the day, and then we have the range on the different uh, Monte Carlo years that we simulated, um, which represent the the uh, P10, P40, P P60, and P90. Um, uh, over the, the different uh, Monte Carlo years. Uh, so what we observe is that the, um, <clears throat> the the need for this backup capacity is quite limited in summer in inter season, and that um, in uh, winter then we have the the main generation of this backup capacity. So basically from November to uh, February. So in the scenario presented here, um, we have also to note that the grid is limited and then. It means that countries with a structural undersupply uh, cannot import all the energy that they need uh, because of the grid. So the grid is a bit the, the constraint here, and so it means that if um, we go for a, a higher uh, level of the grid, we we could again 
a decrease the um, at the generation of this uh, of those uh, backup capacity. So um, as a final conclusion of, on the on this part, uh, maybe in, in two points. Uh, for the first one, um, we see that there is um, a, a significant uh, backup capacity need, but that the amount of running hours is quite limited. Um, it means that the the choice of technology to uh, to cover this um, uh, to cover this gap uh, will be mainly related to a technology with low investment cost. And uh, secondly, we see that with um, a balanced rest mix, uh, with sufficient interconnection, and with the, um, uh, the availability and the um, uh, with the, the high level of flexibility of end user, we can significantly reduce the the backup capacity need. Um, yeah, so that was it for the for the adequacy parts. I hope it was it was clear. Okay, thank you, Louis. I see that we just got some questions. I was already afraid that we would get none of them. So I share my screen here. Um, OK, first question is from uh, Peter Klaas. Um, how will the 7.5 up to 15 uh, gigawatt of backup capacity uh, be financed, will this require a permanent uh, capacity remuneration scheme? So who is going to tackle that one? I can do it, yeah. OK. Um, so this is, uh, no, I think, think it's a short answer, Peter. So it was not, we didn't assess uh, whether those backup capacities are they economically viable or not in the system. So this was out of scope of the study. What we did is to quantify the, the amount of backup that would be required, but we didn't look at the economics of, of, of those units in, in 30 years from now. Uh, because yeah, the market design uh, in, 20, in 30 years can change. Uh, so we, we can't conclude on whether you need that or not uh, for uh, having those backup capacities uh, present in 2050. So it's out of scope of, of this study. OK, then the next question from Ruben Lalma. If Belgium needs 7.5 up to 15 gigawatt of backup, this is similar to the size of backup of today. Does this mean that mostly in other countries there would be a low need for backup and Belgium and Germany would still need more or less the same amount of backup than today? Yes, so I can take this question. So um, so indeed, this, uh, the level of backup capacity is um, yeah, in absolute value the same as today. But what we have to keep in mind is that the, uh, the total electricity demand for Belgium um, I will significantly increase. So in in relative numbers, uh, this amount of backup capacity, um, in fact, is uh, is reduced. And for the um, the second part of um, of the question, um, so indeed there is a, a a significant amount of backup capacity in uh, in Belgium, but also in Germany. And in fact, uh, in all the countries which are um, structurally in uh, in undersupply. So that's what what we presented with the um, with the graph at European level with the uh, all the countries in structural oversupply and undersupply. So yeah, indeed uh, the countries with undersupply will uh, um, will require uh, a bit more backup capacity than the than the other one. Okay, then we have a question from Ivo van Isterdal. Backup needs uh, 7.5 up to 15 gigawatt. How? So I think this is probably a question on technology. So who is going to tackle that one? Um, yeah. So Ali, regarding uh, if it's re uh, related to the, the choice of technology. So as as I said in the in the intro, um, yeah, there is. Um, I didn't know no choice of technology that is uh, mentioned in the in the study um, because yeah we assume that it can be covered by uh, yeah by different um, a climate neutral technology and that, that yeah this this choice doesn't need to to occur uh, to occur today uh, regarding that there is still some uh, some technologies under under developments and that 
yeah, potentially new technologies can also appear uh, as yeah as a result of uh, of technological breakthrough on the way to 2050. So yeah, it can be a fine. It could be hydrogen fired gas uh, gas turbine, as as I mentioned, uh, um, fuel cells or additional biomass. So yeah, that's uh, that's what we we consider. Okay, and then on the next question from Ivo Vanisedal, I think Louis already mentioned, yeah, green molecules, res based can be one of the technologies uh, to, to provide adequacy. So I think that's also covered. Then we have a question from Fabienne Marshall. Do you quantify the impact of the needed backup capacity on imbalance prices? Um, yeah, maybe I can tackle this one. Uh, we didn't consider this and we don't see hey what we studied in in this study is um the the market until the latest uh, market time frame so they had intraday time frame we didn't uh, simulate the imbalance market or the related imbalance prices which probably in 2050 will be quite different anyway because of the high volumes of end user flexibility that we assume to be active in the market. So, voila. Then the next question from Hans van der Siepe. Does this backup capacity then use molecules that are produced by electricity during summer and mid season and included in the produced energy? So, who is going to tackle this one? Yeah, so uh, indeed uh, in the graph that we presented uh, before uh, with the, the amount of um, of green molecules that need to be uh, that, that are needed um, in the European energy system, we do not take into account the uh, the potential molecules that that would be needed for um, for backup capacity. So that's molecule that would be on top of what we uh, what we presented on the on the global values and um, yeah, for the second part of the of the question, um, we do not take any assumptions on the fact that it should be produced um, in uh, in Europe during summer or on, and mid season, or on the fact that it fine it can also be um, uh, imported. So um, I, this is not uh, I, I, this is not especially the. Um, there, there is no no se uh, seasonal. Um, a seasonal storage which would should be needed to to cover this uh, this need okay and then we have the last question of Ruben Lallemand so on the 7.5 to 15 gigawatt of backup why is this capacity only used in winter Zero CO2 steerable capacity could be used the entire year. This would benefit the load factor for these assets. New backup technologies could become cheaper also in the future, like carbon capture and storage, batteries, H2, so they could be base load. Who is going to tackle that one? I can do it, and I can start and don't hesitate for my colleagues can can complement, of course. No? Uh, so first of all, uh, Ruben, so in the economic dispatch tool we use, uh, the backup generation uh, has, a, has a higher, let's say, marginal cost to be set up because whether you use indeed hydrogen or, or you could consider CCS and stuff, it always be, be more expensive than using directly the renewables that are produced in the system. So renewables will be always dispatched first. Uh, so uh, the backup capacity, as its name, is there to ensure that the moments where you don't have those renewables, uh, that they are actually uh, uh, bridging the gap for those moments. So that's how they are they are set up. Um, so this is why they are only used during the moments where you have less low resting feed or high consumption, which are indeed during the winter. Um, so in this case, that's how how we how we model things uh, and how we took into account that. And for batteries, this is considered. Huh? So you mentioned batteries, but we've considered quite a lot of batteries, I think, or storage facilities, and that you indeed see that those can indeed help you for a few hours or maybe within the day. But to keep moments with one or two weeks without uh, wind, for instance, in feed in winter, you will need something uh, that can ensure uh, to bridge uh, one or, or two weeks of of of, uh, of low resting feed in Europe. I don't know if uh, Jan or Louis you want to complement or, or Karsten. Yeah, maybe on, on the idea of running a green H2 plants in base loads. 
Um, that's something where we also describe in, in the study that this is not very efficient because to produce the, the green molecules, you will need quite some renewables you will have conversion losses, so you will keep, I think in our study, we have an optimistic 80% of the energy uh, to, to produce and the green H2, and then you will burn it again in a gas turbine, so you have an efficiency somewhere optimistically between 50-60%. So in the end, you would need more renewables installed than the power you would get out of these uh, base load uh, H2 units. So I think for batteries, indeed, we consider them. Uh, for base load uh, green H2 units, we don't really see the, the economy uh, over there. I don't know, Kerstin or somebody else, if, if you have something to add on this one. Yeah, and maybe as a, as a final point, we also don't identify already now which technology will need to provide the, the backup generation, the, the backup generation. Uh, Will also this decision will be need, need to be made, like Louis mentioned, uh, at a later stage. In the first stage, it's important to get a renewable expansion to the level that we need to actually be able to reduce the CO2 emissions of the current installed uh, park already. And then during these evolutions and during the coming 30 years, new technologies can also arise. So, so it's already still a question which technology will in the end provide the, the, the backup capacity. So I think, yeah, just to complement a little bit what uh, my colleagues already mentioned. Yeah, and maybe to conclude, I think our study is, is quite clear on, on the need for quite a lot of steerable backup capacity. So we hope that this can also start to debate and on, on the longer run how this can be implemented. Eh? So uh, a system with high renewables can work However, for these one or two weeks in winter where you don't have a lot of uh, wind and sun, we need something. Running hours will be low. And so I think over the upcoming decades, there will need to be this discussion on which kind of technologies and how can we make sure that, that the lights can be kept on. So, yeah. Voila. Then, um, okay. Okay, let's go to the last block then, Kerstin. Yes. Okay, so now I will shortly present as a conclusion the focus points that we took out of this study as ELIA group. So these are the aspects where we think that the focus should be uh, over the upcoming years. So if you go to the next slide. So for us, one of the main conclusions we take from this study is that renewables will be scarce in, in the future. And so we should make the most efficient use out of it. And so for this, uh, first of all, it is very important that uh, countries having a deficit of renewables and countries having excess of renewables, that they work together and that sufficient interconnection is built as to make sure that the direct electricity needs can be met with renewable energy in, in the different countries. And also looking at these uh, scarce potential of, of renewables, we also believe that uh, good relations with UK and Norway, given their massive offshore potential in, in the North Sea, uh, is quite important. And then finally, as we will not have probably enough uh, renewable energy in Europe to cover the total energy demand, it's also important that we start to look at how we might import in Belgium and Germany the green molecules. And there today we are already a hub for gas in, in uh, Belgium and, and Germany. And so we might need to start to think on how we could uh, take up such kind of a role uh, also for molecules in Belgium. Then the second aspect is more on the acceleration of the renewables deployment. Um, so yeah, on the European level, uh, three times as fast as today. That's a big challenge. It will not come uh, from itself. And so there we believe that permitting times uh, should be reduced. So in our uh, paper, we suggest to start already with the target of trying to, to half uh, the, the permitting time. Um, and another aspect on this res deployment is also the importance of keeping the right mix. 
So as Kasten has shown before, if we have the right mix of wind and solar energy, then we can also avoid this uh, seasonal structural mismatch between uh, supply and demand. And that's why it's also so important that the development of wind keeps pace with the development of solar energy. And then looking for onshore wind, uh, there's the permitting issues and, and public acceptance where we need to look at. And then, of course, for offshore wind in Europe, it's important to make sure that sufficient space will be foreseen in the seas to be able to reach uh, the target of this 400 gigawatt of offshore. Um, and then a last point on this accelerated res deployment is that we need to make sure that the infrastructure will be ready to, uh, in a later stage, also accept more renewable energies. So here the discussion on leading infrastructure uh, needs to be held, we believe, over the upcoming years to make sure that the grid will not become a bottleneck in decarbonization of our uh, energy consumers in Belgium and Germany. A third focus point for us is the importance of incentivizing electrification. Why electrification? We believe it's a double win. So as Raphael has shown in the first part of the presentation, uh, electrification comes with energy efficiency uh, automatically because, for example, EVs and heat pumps are more efficient than their uh, molecule uh, I than a, a gas boiler or an IC vehicle. So that means that with the scarce renewables that we have, if we electrify more, we can decarbonize more with a similar level of renewables. And we also believe that electrification is important because it will unlock the flexibility that is needed uh, to accommodate more uh, solar PV, for example, in the system. So it gives the flexibility that facilitates further uh, REST integration. Of course, for this to happen, we need a market design that unlocks this flexibility also at end users, um, and we need digitalization for that to happen. And then a final point, uh, which for us is important to stress is that we see that in both scenarios, we will need a lot of green molecules. Um, and on that, we believe that we should first use these green molecules in sectors where direct electrification is not an option. So in the sectors where it provides most value, uh, for example, to replace gray hydrogen already in today's industry. Um, we believe that it is important to make sure that there's always sufficient renewables um, available for direct electrification. And then if there is something left, that can be used to produce uh, green hydrogen locally. The reason we believe this is because green molecules are more easy to import over large distances and from other continents than uh, electrons uh, typically. So those are the main takeaways that we have uh, from this study. And then I think we can now go to, to the latest uh, Q&A session on this and then we will have the closing remarks. So I will now share my screen to get to the questions. OK, the first question from uh, Victor Mouton. Um, regarding the permitting uh, procedure for onshore wind and transmission lines, what kind of improvements should the governments uh, try to achieve? Um, yeah, I think first one is, is mainly related to, to the duration of the processes, so we, we should try to get it as short as possible. Uh, for example, in Germany, we now see that there is also a lot of effort or a lot of um, yeah, effort being put into digitalization of the process to really speed up every kind of yeah, step in the procedure in, in the, the best possible way. And then, and, and this is something that, for example, also other partners like your electric say, if you see the amount of renewables that need to come, maybe we should revise uh, the, the permitting schemes. Eh? Uh, I think your electric uh, starts to talk about things like uh, bulk permitting, etc., to make sure that the renewables come. This is a delicate matter, but 
maybe the discussion should start on what can we actually do to yeah to to speed this up i hope that that gives an answer on the first one then we have a question from peter klaas please take board the cost aspects will this model deliver competitive affordable energy prices and to introduce technology neutrality so who can tackle this one uh, I, I can already start but looking at the cost aspects i think towards 2050 it's it's very difficult um, to accurately define the cost aspects of, of all different technologies. There are a lot of uncertainties already on the short term, and they even become more and more uh, uh, wider in the end uh, on, on the long term. So looking, for example, at how will the hydrogen price evolve, how will the technology cost evolve for, um, on the one hand, uh, the renewable energies, but also for the backup capacities. So, so there is really a lot of uh, difficulties, and that's also why we decided to look at it more from a, a technical technological perspective um, to see whether or not it would be feasible uh, to be able to uh, to deliver such a, a, a electricity system or to enable such an electricity system. And then uh, on the uh, technology neutrality, in the end, we are technology neutral in this study. Um, we uh, do not have a preference towards any technology. Okay. Then the next question from Victor Mouton. The past few papers have been very interesting. Big thanks for that. What are next steps Elia will take to put Belgium on the right track to net zero to help turning uh, the paper into reality? um good question i will come back on that uh so next year's study we will focus on decarbonization of industry because that will be a very important one i think for both electricity and and gas system so there we want to work together with all the the partners set up an ecosystem to to investigate that one and to clarify a bit more yeah the the assumptions and and the possible scenarios for this kind of decarbonization so that's the first thing and the second thing is, of course, this this kind of study. It's we are showing it to to lots of policymakers, etc. We hope that it starts a debate. Um, I know in Belgium we are today very focused on what's going to happen in in the upcoming five or ten years, um, but that's only the beginning. And so with this study, we we hope to start the debate towards 2050, and also that we yeah with all the external stakeholders, uh, with policymakers, etc., that we can uh, go in the direction and, and take the right decisions to, to go to a carbon neutral system. As I said before, our scenarios are not exhaustive. External things can happen, policies can change, etc. But we believe that at least our study shows a bit like the, the magnitude of, of the challenge that is coming towards us. And starting from that, I think we now need to get more and more concrete on how, yeah, we can we can put this in practice. Eh? So this is more like a quantification of what can happen, and then the next step is on how to make it happen uh, for sure. So I hope that's an answer on your question. Then the next question of uh, Sarge Swinen, what about costs? Are these cost estimates on investment needs, infrastructure needs, flexibility needs, import, etc.? cetera? Uh, are there cost estimates, sorry? Um, who can take that one? I can take it. So I think I, as explained by Karsten, uh, it's not something that we looked at it in the study. If you want cost estimates, I, mean, I would say per device or per per infrastructure requirements. You can find that in other studies that either Elia publishes, but also other uh, types of organization. Uh, uh, but we have not looked at uh, costs uh, or total cost of the scenarios because for the reasons already explained. So there is a huge uncertainty on that uh, in the coming 30 years uh, for the cost. And also to what until when do you do you stop? Do you stop at at, I would say, 
generation level or do you stop at end device level? Do you look at other kinds of costs, social shelter costs, uh, materials, uh, scarcity of materials and stuff? So it's, it's quite a, a complicated uh, aspect that we have not looked at in, in the framework of this study. I hope that answers the questions. Uh, and Kaftan, Jan or Lee, do not hesitate huh, to, to complement. No, I think you provided the good answer. And then we have a last question of Ruben Lallemand, which goes, I think, in the same direction. So I understand the model is based on economic efficient dispatch. This is based on the marginal dispatch costs. I have the impression that the investment costs are not modeled in detail. Hence, is there a risk of promoting a high investment, low marginal cost solution? Am I missing something? Um, I think there, yeah, we, we already addressed this uh, both by me and by Raphael, just to say on a, on a final note, if you look at the levelized cost of uh, energy for the different technologies, currently renewable energies are the cheapest. So, and again, as I said before, our scenarios are not exhaustive, so we are more than happy to, to discuss uh, alternative uh, scenarios, should you like to come back to us with some proposals. Okay, then thank you very much for all the questions. Um, maybe, Kerstin, we can now switch to the last block. So what's next? So in the beginning, I showed that we do like a big study every year. And so next year we will study on the, uh, yeah, the zoom in on the energy transition in industry. And so there we are looking to team up with uh, external stakeholders uh, and we will focus mainly on three segments um, for, the, for the time being. So first is energy intensive industries like how are they going to do the, the energy transition and what could that eventually mean for the electricity grids? Uh, then also data centers, which is a little bit different. And then the third one is service and logistics centers. So more companies that have widespread locations. So how can they decarbonize uh, their portfolio? So this is also directly an invitation. Should we, should you be a stakeholder and should you be interested uh, to to participate to this study, please contact us at info at alia.be. And then there's one last thing I would like to do. So during this study, we contacted over more than 50 uh, stakeholders. And so we would like to thank all of them for the feedback that they've provided to us and for the contributions they delivered. We were not able to put all the logos on these slides, uh, so there are many more, but a big thanks uh, to all of them. And also a big thanks to you to, to participate in this meeting and for all the questions. I hope it was interesting. And as I told before, we will make this uh, recording available on our website and we will come back uh, to the questions that we didn't answer uh, during this session. So thanks a lot and have a very nice rest of the afternoon. Thanks a lot, everyone.